Hi there, welcome back to the layout once again. Uh, I've got quite a bit done since the last video that I shared with you, so let's just jump into it and take a look at what's new. One of the things I've been meaning to get for quite a long time is an ESU loc programmer, and I finally gone ahead and did that, and I've played around with it some. Um, it's a pretty cool device. You can see I've got it plugged in back here uh, in the staging room. That's where we're at right now. I guess it's the dispatcher's room, not really staging room. Um, and so there's a power strip underneath the bench work here. I've just got this kind of temporarily set up and I've got a simple piece of track. I've got my track outputs hooked up and then with the USB, the serial to USB hookup, I've got this running on, um, a little windows laptop. So this is the interface here. Um, I won't in this video go through how I understand to use it. Cause there's still a lot I have yet to unlock, but it's as simple as placing a locomotive on that track there and as long as this is all hooked up i can then hit this button there and that will read the decoder data and then it'll load all the parameters of the decoder assuming that it's an esu decoder you can only program esu decoders on here and then you can change all sort of um all sort of aspects you know function mapping uh sound values motor trim things like that so it's a super cool toy I still want to play around with it more, especially with custom sounds, but I have already gone ahead and updated a number of sound files in my locomotives. So one of those locomotives that got a sound file update is the Scale Trains ES44 C4. I put the most recent Jivo 12 Prime Mover sound package in here. Um, but one of the other things that I did as well as update all of the sound files that I could is I changed the function mapping scheme as well as the lighting effects, uh, at least how they behave on all of my ESU decoders. And so um, with the lighting effects, I like there to be non-directional lighting, as in this locomotive right now is facing in the forward direction. But if I change the direction on the throttle and want to reverse this locomotive and the train, the lighting effects that I have on will stay there. Um, and so all the lighting is controlled independently. And that also means that I have the rear headlight set to turn on separately from the front headlight. And I use function nine to do that. So you'll just have to trust me that the front lights are on as they were, but if I hit F9 here, oh, sorry. You'll see the, uh, the headlight comes on. With all of that said, I would like to kind of demonstrate some of the new sounds that are on this decoder. Mainly, I think the horn sounds great, and then I'll also get it up to speed, and we'll see this train descend the grade, and you'll, you'll hear a very accurate GE dynamic break.
back a couple months ago, Greg from MacRail visited me uh, for a cool layout tour and just a, a nice chat. It was really great to meet him. Um, and as some of you probably already know, since you have his products on your layout, he makes some awesome stuff. And recently, I guess not that recently, a few months now ago, uh, MacRail released the version two of their end of train devices. And these are they just look fantastic. They're to scale. Um, I think it's a huge improvement on the original version, and those are still fantastic and super fun to use. But it's a universal fit. You can see he brought me the uh, the orange kind. It's kind of hard to see. Um, I don't know how well this will do, but you can see uh, there's sort of a slot that you could fit around the knuckle, or you can also just sort of loosely put it on there depending on the coupler type. So these fit really well on all sorts of couplers I have. I got KDs, McHenry's, um, you know, the stock scale trains ones. I eventually want to, you know, graduate all of my cars to metal semi-scale or scale KD couplers. Uh, but regardless of the type, these MacRail EOTs look fantastic. And it's really fun to just get immersed in the operations and place these on your train when you have to reconfigure power or when you're departing the yard. So a lot of fun added to the operations with these little details. He was kind enough to drop off some PTC bar type antennas as well. So you can see these are the long track type that I now have on BNSF 1631. So at least one of these two ST40-2 units is PTC equipped. And now you'll see this short ballast consist out around on the main line across the layout. And then of course I have a couple of the short bar type PTC or short track type PTC antennas now on the roof of my Walther's mainline ES44AC. These I, I added a bit more or, or you know, uh, spent a bit more time with by painting the sort of bottom lip a dark gray color. I feel like that just makes them pop a little bit and it kind of simulates the base that these get mounted to. So that's a cool detail. And now my whole fleet, minus the Cascade Green BN SD40-2 that you just saw, everything except for that unit is now equipped with PTC antennas. So thanks to Greg for bringing those products over to the layout. Now you may have seen these locomotives sitting in the background of a couple of shots. And one thing that you'll see is that there are some weird details on the front of each of these locomotives. And I'm pretty excited about these, but what I've done here is I've added <clears throat> uh, my best attempt at the helper link details that you'll find on helper locomotives that are, you know, in designated helper service. So on a few locations across the BNSF system, there are helper sets that are used. Um, one of them is Crawford Hill, which I previously modeled, but also Essex, Montana, which we're sitting at right here on the layout, is a helper base along the Highline subdivision. Uh, and specifically on Marias Pass. And I it, I guess uh, information that I've recently received suggests that they don't use helper link currently, but as recently as I wanna say 2017 or later, I still have photos of, of helper locomotives based out of Essex using helper link. And the gist of this system um, and all those boxes and air hoses up there is that it allows trains to cut or excuse me allows helper locomotives to cut off from a train that they're pushing on the fly so in other words the train does not have to come to a stop for the locomotives to uncouple it's a remote system where the locomotive engineer can basically input a radio tone and that radio tone will automatically uh, trigger this system to physically lift the coupler pin on the helper locomotive and then these locomotives as long as this is being performed under 20 miles per hour you uh, can then you know, slowly apply the brakes and the helper locomotives will peel away from the train as it continues on its journey. So on the real thing, there are a lot more wires and hoses coming out of this thing, but I opted to model the three main ones um, because after that it gets a little complicated and challenging to do. But I have the MU hose that goes from the main box there. There is also a train airline hose that connects to one of the uh, MU air hoses and then also excuse me the the train airline hose connects to you know the main air hose next to the coupler but there's also 
uh, a multiple unit airline hose that connects as well. So those are the three wires slash cables. For the MU cable, I'm just using decoder wire um, that I salvaged from a locomotive project. And then I had some uh, similarly sized, I think also decoder or maybe lighting wire from a locomotive project that I use for the, the heavier gauge air hose. And then the finer gauge air hose that connects to one of the MU hoses, I, I modeled that out of the, uh, what is it, Berkshire Junction's easy line. It's the heavy black easy line. That's the same detail material that I've used elsewhere on tunnels and uh, my completed snow shed as well. Then for the boxes themselves, the main box that's in the middle of the two end handrail stanchions, that is a 3D printed part and I'm forgetting the company right now, but you can find that part, I believe on eBay. If you just search, uh, like helper link, HO scale details. I modified it a little bit. There's like a red stand on the base of that box that you can see. It's very, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at prototype photos, it's there. And then the other box that's attached to sort of the upper center of that box, I just used some like scrap uh, Walther's bits and pieces that I had in a box somewhere. And those are just, I tried to cut, you know, just a square um, box, painted it light gray, and then painted the face of it white. There's all sorts of different configurations of these helper link details, but I went off some photos um, that I had seen. This is a bit older of a configuration. I think um, this is more of like a 2008, 2009 kind of setup. And since then they've switched to a different configuration, but it still seems to be all the same bits and pieces for the most part. So you can never have enough lumber loads or center beam flat cars when you're modeling the Highline subdivision. And recently I've expanded my pretty modest lumber fleet. Um, first thing I added were a couple of BNSF center beam flat cars, such as this one here. There's another one down on the other end of the yard that you can't see from here. So added two center beams. These are newer Atlas releases. Um, they, they're, as I mentioned, BNSF scheme with the yellow safety striping, and they have some pretty great underbody detail. So these are, these are really cool cars. But additionally, I also have added a few more loads. Um, so I picked up a couple of Weyerhaeuser center beam flat car loads that will complement the one that I already had. And then I also grabbed a Riverside lumber load. Um, I just really like the look of the, uh, the blue and green wrapping on these loads here. So whether I already had it or I added it, you know, as a new load, all the loads received some weight as well. So that was a project that I had in the, the back of my mind for a while is that in addition to just having the, the very light plastic lumber loads on the cars, I also wanted to add a bit of heft to the loads themselves. And so I used quarter ounce wheel weights, quarter ounce automotive wheel mate, excuse me, wheel weights, and just adhered those to the inside of the plastic loads before I assembled them or, you know, plopped them in place on the car. And I weighted the whole car, including the load, to seven ounces. Um, there's no particular reason that I chose seven ounces. It just felt like a hefty enough weight, um, you know, to, to make the car feel a bit different from its unloaded counterpart. And what's great about that is then when you have a mixed freight, such as, you know, uh, this manifest that's being assembled that'll head up the grade, if you have a bunch of these seven ounce weighted lumber loads in your consist, in your, you know, your, your train that you're pulling up the grade, you definitely have to take in consideration that added weight. And um, with those heavy loaded cars, it's very likely that that train will require helpers up at Essex. So um, it's, you know, the cars I think look cool with the loads. I'll eventually add more detail to the loads themselves, but they also serve an operational purpose. And that is that they, they definitely make the eastbound uh, mixed freights a bit heavier and uh, they struggle to get up the grade when you've got a string of these on the head end. Well, that is all I have for this video. So as always, thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned and I will see you next time.